my favorite thing about working in healthcare is the people. This industry brings together brilliant, highly motivated individuals who are driven by the opportunity to make a difference. My name is Hallie Tecco, and this is The Heart of Healthcare, a podcast where I'll be introducing you to the people on the ground moving the needle in public health and medicine. Due to social distancing guidelines, there are fewer shelter beds in communities across America. Our young people really have been in survival mode when they find us and haven't been focused on building a foundation. They've been focused on surviving from day to day and keeping themselves safe and well. There's a under supply of housing that's affordable in every city in this country. Once someone enters homelessness, it is very difficult for them to get out. And that is especially true for seniors, many of whom are beginning to experience homelessness for the first time. Today, we're diving into the topic of homelessness and health. The connection between housing and homelessness is generally intuitive, but the link between health and homelessness is often overlooked. For a lot of people, homelessness and poor health is a vicious cycle. The majority of bankruptcies in the U.S. are due to medical issues, like being unable to pay medical bills or time lost from work due to a sickness. What starts as injury or illness can quickly become a financial problem, followed by a housing problem. Homelessness then creates new health problems and exacerbates existing ones. Communicable diseases, malnutrition, violence, behavioral health issues, lack of medication storage. People who are homeless have higher rates of illness and die on average 12 years sooner than the general population. Today, I'm talking to homelessness expert Dr. Margot Cushell, a professor of medicine at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, the director of UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations, and director of the new Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. Dr. Cushell's research focuses on reducing the burden of homelessness on health through examining efforts to prevent and end homelessness and mitigating the effects of housing instability on healthcare outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Cushell. Hi, thanks for having me. So there's a growing body of evidence that chronic homelessness is not just a housing issue, but fundamentally a healthcare issue. Can you tell us a little bit more about why homelessness is a healthcare problem? Yeah, when I think about homelessness and health, I think of the quote from Matthew Desmond in his book, Evicted, where he says, without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. Once people have lost their housing, it becomes so incredibly difficult to take care of them in any of the ways that we normally think of in our modern healthcare system. And so it really becomes the number one issue. What we see is that people get sicker, they're exposed to the environment, they can't take their medicines because their medicines get lost or stolen. They're spending all of their energy just trying to figure out where they sleep at night and where they get food. They're likely to get assaulted. They tend to be more depressed and anxious. And so small problems become big problems. And then they really have very limited access to the healthcare system. Our system isn't really set up for people who don't have an address, who are unlikely to have a phone, who don't have transportation. So they're unable to come in and get routine care. So much of what we do in modern healthcare is that we expect to treat people as outpatients, but you really can't do that. So you have people who not only are getting sicker, but we can't take care of small problems as an outpatient. We need to bring people into the hospital. Um, so we lower our admission thresholds. It's harder to discharge people. So basically, there is so little that we can offer people who are homeless. And in my mind, housing becomes the biggest issue. There is no medicine as powerful as housing. And conversely, there is no threat to health as serious as homelessness. And when you say chronic homelessness, can you define that for us? 
we talk about chronic homelessness as people who are homeless for a year or more or have multiple episodes, four or more episodes in three years that add up to more than a year and who have a disabling condition. So this was a definition that is put forth in a lot of ways um, because it determines who becomes eligible for certain programs and because it's always thought about as a more severe manifestation as homelessness. I would say until relatively recently, we thought that people who were chronically homeless were all people with very severe behavioral health conditions, substance use, mental health conditions. To be honest, the cost of housing has gotten so expensive and it's so hard to get rehoused that we find many people who meet the definition of chronic homelessness without having those severe behavioral health conditions. So in some ways, the experience of it is changing, but it's really the most severe manifestation of homelessness. Do we know what percentage of people that become homeless become chronically homeless? That is a really great question. And you would think we would know that, but we actually don't. Um, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we thought about 10% of people who became homeless became chronically homeless. Then um, more recently, people thought 20%. My guess is that it's a larger proportion now. You know, you do need to have that disabling condition to count as chronically homeless. But to be honest, once people are homeless for a year or more, they generally have gained a disabling condition anyway. Believe it or not, we don't actually know. At any given time, if you look at single homeless adults, so these are not kids um, in families or these are not parents in homeless families. These are just the adults who are homeless without minor children. We think about half of people who are homeless at any point in time are chronically homeless, but that number might be rising. Wow. So America's homeless population is larger than any other developed economy. And on any given night, more than half a million people experience homelessness. And one third of them are in just one state, California. Why does this plague our country? You know, homelessness plagues our country because of some fundamental inequities. People like to think that homelessness is caused by mental health or substance use problems, but truthfully, the proportion of the population who has those problems is pretty similar across developed you know, Western nations. What is different are some particular United States inequities. When I think of homelessness, I think of three main causes. One is the dire lack of housing that's affordable to the lowest income households. We call these households extremely low income households or households that make less than 30% of the area median income. So that's a different number in Los Angeles than it is in a small town in Mississippi. But each community has you know, their own share of people who make less than 30% of the area median income. And across the country, there are only 36 units of housing that are available and affordable for every 100 extremely low-income households. So in some ways, we have a giant game of musical chairs. California is the second worst state in the nation. We only have 24 units of housing that's available and affordable for every 100 extremely low-income households. The two other reasons that I would point to is income inequality. So we often see more homelessness in areas with high housing costs and in areas with um, higher income inequality. And those two things tend to go together when you have a lot of high income earners driving up housing costs in a region with a lot of poverty, you see a lot of homelessness. And then the third reason is America's ongoing struggle and in some ways our original sin of structural racism. We know that Black Americans are at a three to four-fold risk of homelessness. In some of the major areas in California, we see that disparity even greater. Housing is really the primary means of wealth building in this country. It's how most American families who have wealth have built their wealth. And it's important to remember that Black Americans were excluded from that wealth building because of legal laws on our books that existed until very recently in modern history, where it was perfectly legal for communities to not allow black 
households to buy property in their community. And equally, it was legal for the banks to not offer mortgages to people based on where they could live. So basically, if you lived in one of the communities that Black folks were allowed to live, the banks wouldn't offer you a mortgage. So Black Americans were really systematically excluded from the wealth building and housing markets. We know that even now where there's fair housing laws on the books, where that's no longer legal, we see time and time again discrimination in the rental markets so that white white households who try to rent a household with the same criteria as a black household are less likely to be offered that rental, so they pay more for the same housing. We know that... Um, that um, Black Americans were really targeted in the foreclosure crisis and in the predatory lending markets. And then we have all the other forms of well-documented discrimination in the criminal justice markets, in employment, in um, in the ways... Uh, in the, in the educational systems, which of course are built around where you live and where you live is very much still corresponding to those originally what we called redlined housing things. So it's not surprising that black Americans are at such increased risk of homelessness, but this explains why America or the United States has so much more homelessness than other developed nations. Yeah, that's so interesting. The whole mentality, American mentality of the, the meritocratic worldview that you get what you deserve, I think, I imagine is what leads Americans to believe that it's mental health and substance abuse issues that lead to homelessness. And so your work is so important because you're peeling back the layers to understand the root cause and how most of the time it's not at the fault of the homeless person at all. Exactly. Homelessness is a result of a series of policy failures over many years, and frankly, a result of just the way we've organized our country. It's much easier to try to blame people for their problems than it is to try to look at the systems and structures that are so built into American society. And when you take very stigmatized conditions, things like mental health and substance use disorders, which are very, very stigmatized, um, you know, health conditions, responses to trauma and the like, it's much easier to sort of blame people who have these conditions than it is to grapple with our policies and our structural conditions, which have really left us open for this problem. So your research unveiled that the homeless population is aging. You found that while in 1990, 11% of people experiencing homelessness were 50 and older, but today that proportion has skyrocketed to about half of homeless people being 50 and older. Why are Americans who were born in the second half of the baby boom at an elevated risk for homelessness today? Yeah, so this is really interesting. You know, when I when I started doing this work, we talked about homelessness as a problem of young adults, but I am a physician and was working in the hospital and time and time again we're seeing people who were not young adults who are homeless. And we um, did this research that showed that in San Francisco, when you looked at homeless single adults, 11% were 50 and older in, in the early 90s. And by 2003, 37% were. Now, when we look at point in time counts and other things, it's about half. My colleague at University of Pennsylvania, Dennis Culhane, looked at shelter records over a long time and found that, in fact, people born in the second half of the baby boom were at this elevated risk of homelessness. So when that big part of the population was in their 30s, that was where most people who were homeless were when they were in their 40s, 50s, et cetera. He's recently shown that the biggest population gains in people who are homeless are going to be those 65 and older, whose proportion is going to triple between now and 2030. My research looked at people who were 50 and older, so just looking at those who were 50 and older, and we found that nearly half of them had their first ever episode of homelessness after the age of 50. So that for many of these folks who are 50 and older, it's not that they became homeless in their 20s and 30s and stayed homeless. It was more that that they were sort of at increased risk throughout their lives. And then one or two things happened later in life that put them into homelessness. 
when you think about this generation, they really had a lot of bad luck. They entered the job market for the first time during a recession. And we know that when people enter the job market during a recession, they never make up the lost income. This was a generation that sort of entered the housing market at a time of massive federal retrenchment in support for affordable housing. So right as this group of people were sort of aging into moving out of their parents' home and moving into their own homes was a time where there was a real shift in federal policies towards how we supported affordable housing. It was a generation that really got caught up in the changing criminal justice policies, which led to mass incarceration. It was just a generation that just had a lot of bad luck. And so for those who became homeless before 50 and are still homeless in their 50s and 60s, We see individuals who had really traumatic childhoods. They never fully entered the job market. They had lots of substance use and mental health problems and prison histories and really struggled their whole lives. For those who were newly homeless late in life, we see something very different. We see individuals who worked at low-wage jobs that were physically demanding but paid little. Like construction or? Construction, janitors, generally non-unionized jobs. And I would say that was the other thing that this generation really hit was that they entered the job market at a time with decreased union membership and increased strength of unions, right? So these folks were working minimum wage, physically demanding jobs. So they were working in warehouses or they were working as security guards or driving, you know, driving, um, trucks or, you know, doing transportation, but basically they were not in unions. They did not have pensions and their jobs are very physically demanding and hard to do as they got older and sicker. And what we saw is that they were sort of barely hanging on, working two or three jobs, you know, just making it. And then sometime after the age of 50, something happened. Either they got sick and they could no longer do their physically demanding job, their spouse or partner got sick and couldn't do it, their marriage broke up, they lost their job or their spouse or partner lost their job, their spouse or partner died or their mom died. We saw lots of people who were living in the family home in their 40s, 50s, 60s because they were working these low-wage jobs and couldn't you know, move out. And mm-hmm. then suddenly mom dies in her 70s and they've got no title to the apartment. They're not on the lease and they get um, sent to the streets. I just think that we've left a lot of people very, very vulnerable and that the population who's homeless is really just a small population of those who are at high risk. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So the risk factors for homelessness actually differ between the age groups. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think this this um, group has just in some ways got um, caught in all the wrong policies. I worry that we could be replicating that, you know, in a, in a later generation. Um, but I really think that people who are working low-wage jobs, paying 40, 50, 60% of their rent in housing, which is what we're forcing people to do, when they can no longer keep it up, you know, one small disruption, right? They or their spouse can no longer work 18 hours a day at physically demanding jobs. Suddenly they find themselves out on the street. So tell us the difference between shelter and housing. Yeah, that's a great question because this gets confused a lot. Um, You know, I'm from the Bay Area, and in the Bay Area, about three quarters of people who are homeless are unsheltered. They're living outside or they're living in their cars. They're very visible to the general public. You can contrast that with a place like New York City, where only 5% of people who are homeless are unsheltered. And if you walk around San Francisco, you would think that the homelessness problem in San Francisco is much worse than it is in New York City. But actually, there's a slightly higher proportion of the population in New York is homeless than in San Francisco. The big difference is that most of our population is unsheltered. You know, the thing about shelter is it is probably better them being outside for many people. They have bathrooms. You know, they're not exposed to the weather, but actually it is still homeless. And in fact, most of the bad outcomes that we associate with homelessness, it doesn't matter if you're sheltered or unsheltered. In fact, people in shelters have 
you know, terrible, terrible health outcomes and other things. So I think that, you know, something that concerns me is a lot of conversation in California of like, we need to solve the unsheltered homelessness crisis. And of course we need to solve it, but I hope that we don't solve it by just putting people in shelters. I want to um, maybe give a little bit of an image of what shelters are like. Shelters are usually big, big open spaces like a warehouse or, or another room like that with lots and lots of really thin mattresses on the floor or lots of close together bunk beds. People usually need to leave during the day and come back at night. Um, there's no privacy. People can't be with their partners. Their possessions get stolen. It's really not all that great. And during COVID, we in fact saw some of the dangers of shelters, where when COVID got into shelters, it spread. We saw many shelters across the country where an infection would get in and suddenly three quarters of the people in the shelter would be infected. Yeah. So when you're sheltered, it means that you don't have a lease, you don't have privacy, you don't have your own place. When you're housed, it means that you have some autonomy, that you're living in a place. You might be sharing it with others, but it's your place. You're not mm -hmm. sort of following other people's rules. You have some control over who's living with you and who isn't. And it, and it has stability. You know you can stay there until you until you get evicted or until you can't, but shelter is often night by night, week by week, month by month. Mm -hmm. I almost see shelter and the example you gave comparing San Francisco to New York, it's almost like that roof isn't necessarily for the person experiencing homelessness, but for the neighbors who don't want to see the homelessness. It's for the comfort of the neighbors versus really truly solving the problem to begin with. I mean, that is my concern. Look, I, you know, the, it's not that shelter doesn't have some advantages about being unsheltered. Obviously, having access to a bathroom is an important thing and having, you know, not being out in the rain or the cold is really important. But the problem is that when people are sheltered, they're still homeless. Their outcomes are still terrible. And we can spend an incredible amount of resources on shelter. And so I think what we really need to be focusing on, you know, is the endpoint, right? The endpoint is housing and that we shouldn't be looking to solve the problem by putting people in shelter. I agree with you though. I mean, it is really striking when I talk to audiences and I ask them, where is homelessness worse, New York or San Francisco? People sort of look at me funny and they say, well, of course it's worse in San Francisco because in San Francisco, the suffering is really out there for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. And in New York, the suffering is quite hidden. But make no mistake, the suffering is still there. It's easy to get stuck in this life, you know, especially when you don't have no help, no hope. Do you think you're always going to be homeless? Yeah, I've come to terms with the fact I'll probably die out here. What's it like to live here? Uh, you're vulnerable. You can't really be prepared for everything that's out there. You can't get better once you get on the street. There's really no way to get a job. Our needs are relatively simple in that we just want to be housed and we want to be able to live in dignity. In shelter situations, having your own like uh, privacy, it's next to impossible. We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So tell us about your background as a physician and what ultimately led you to this area of work. Yeah, so I am um, a general internist. I'm a UCSF faculty member. I practice at um, our safety net hospital in the city and county of San Francisco, San Francisco General Hospital. And I 
didn't really intend to spend my career working on homelessness. But when I came out to UCSF in San Francisco General in the mid-90s, about half of the patients on the inpatient medicine service were homeless at San Francisco General. And what we would do is we would admit them to the hospital. We would take, you know, fantastic care of them. We would think of everything that could possibly be wrong and spend all of these, you know, incredible healthcare resources doing what we needed to do to fix people up. And then we would need to throw them out, basically discharge them into the streets because there was no other place for them to go. And inevitably, a few days later, They would come back to the hospital, usually sicker than they were, you know, the last time. And there was part of me that thought, this doesn't make any sense. Like, there's no amount of good medicine I can practice. There's no amount of, like, the perfect drug I can give that actually makes up for the fact that I'm about to discharge this person back to this um, living environment on the street or in a crowded shelter. And so I decided to change what I was doing. And I really focused my efforts on learning more about homelessness so that I could end it. And now I spend much more of my time doing research and policy work around trying to end homelessness than I do seeing patients. I still do see patients and I love seeing patients, but it just felt like it was a better use of my time because I feel like the healthcare system has so little to offer compared to the difference that housing would make. So what's been the hardest part of your job? Mm. I think the hardest part of my job is that you know, I've been doing this now for 25 years, and the problem just keeps getting worse and worse. It's been so hard to move our policies towards what we need because it would frankly take such such an acknowledgement of our policy failures. So I think it's hard for me in a way when I have the same conversations again and again. You know, there are all these myths out there about homelessness. People are homeless because of personal choices. People want to be homeless. What else do people say? People want to be homeless. It's because, you know, people are bad people and they have these, you know, substance use problems, which people look at as if people were bad people because they had them. I think... um, All of these myths, these myths that, you know, the reason homelessness is bad in San Francisco is because everyone moves here um, to be homeless. The one-way ticket, right? Then the one-way ticket. But none of these (laughs) things are true. Like, it's not true. But people persist in those ideas. And it's been so hard to get policymakers' attention. You know, look, we right now, not only is housing so grossly unaffordable, as I mentioned, with only 36 units nationally for every 100 extremely low-income households, but only one in four households who meets all the strict requirements to receive rental assistance receives it. You can meet all the requirements and only you only have a one in four chance of getting any help. And yet we're willing to spend all of the these resources, churning people through hospitals, you know, building these big shelters, and we won't actually do what it takes. So I guess that's hard. You know, I think it's important to know nothing about my life is that hard. Look, I have a great job. I'm housed. I live with my family. That's not hard. What is hard is to be homeless. And the suffering that people who are homeless experience is is really incredible. I think that um, it can seem hard to be confronted by that suffering. And I worry that we pay more attention to the difficulty of watching suffering. That's why the big push to clear encampments, you know, to get people out of people's line of sight so that we, people who are housed and fortunate and privileged, don't need to stare at their suffering, you know, in our faces. But really what we should be paying attention to is not how hard it is to listen to these stories, but how unbearable it is to live as homeless, how mm. how much suffering there is. And that's actually the, the part that's hard that I want to solve. So we all face naysayers in healthcare, quite a few, I'm sure, um, in your work. So can you tell me about really the biggest roadblock that you faced from the healthcare industry and you taking this on as an MD? Yeah. I mean, I think early in my career, 
people just had no idea what I was doing. I certainly heard a lot of people <laughs> tell me that I was, you know, throwing my career away. You know, now mm. now that it's kind of popular, everybody wants to say they're doing something about homelessness. But I can tell you that 25 years ago, people just kind of looked at me funny, like, well, you know, why are you doing this? This isn't, this doesn't have to, this isn't why you became a doctor, or, you know, you don't need to be a doctor to do this, or this isn't your job, or things like that. I think the big problem is, look, healthcare is a big industry. Um, it uses an enormous part of our GDP, of our, you know, of our country's money goes to healthcare. And maybe that's right. Maybe that's not right. But I think that we need to acknowledge that if our goal here is actually health, we need to put our money and our resources on the things that are going to create health. And to be totally honest, that means putting more money and more resources to ensuring that people have a safe and stable place to live. I think our neglect of this problem played a huge role in, for instance, the COVID pandemic. Not only did we see COVID spread through homeless shelters, but we also saw it spread through wildfire, through people living in extremely crowded housing. You know, that I said early on in the pandemic, I was doing one of um, the UCSF Grand Rounds with um, Dr. Walker, and he was laughing at me because I said the story of this pandemic is the story of essential workers living in overcrowded housing. Mm. And he sort of said, you know, you have a one-track mind, you only think about housing. But it's true, you know, that sure. that when we looked at at the disproportionate burden of covid on people of color and you know essential workers that was that had a lot to do with the fact that the people doing the most essential work in our society who could not stay home during covid their work in fact mm. was so essential that we said you needed to keep going in and doing it were not paid enough to afford um stable housing, and that many of them were living 10, 12, 14 people in a one or two bedroom apartment so that when one member of that household got COVID, everybody got it. I think that's like a really good example of how our failed housing policies have led to health crises. And the solution to that is not building more hospitals. The solution to that is fixing the problem. So I guess if there's any pushback, it's that we in this country will spend any amount of money on medical care, and we won't spend money on what we really need to do to create a healthy, thriving population. Absolutely. It's interesting within public health and the social determinants of health, which have become a quite popular framework to look at healthcare solutions, housing isn't explicitly called out. It kind of bucketed under this whole built environment. Um, so it's where you live, it's your whole neighborhood. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how the social determinants of health, are they addressing housing enough? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a slow but increasing awareness of the role of housing, but I can give you some examples of ways that we fail. We now use electronic health records and one of the, you know, one of the things we love about them is all the data that they generate, but we do not in any manner systematically collect data on people's housing. And I think this limits us in two ways. In the clinical setting, it means that we are often not understanding what's going on because we as clinicians are blind to the fact that the people we're treating may be going home to their car where mm -hmm. they live, or they may be going home to a very overcrowded house, or they may be spending 80% of their income on rent. And that might explain why they're not doing their mammogram better than anything else, right? So I yeah. think it impacts us clinically. But I th also think that in this, you know, love of big data, we might be missing one of the most important elements, or what I would call like one of the most important explanatory markers of like, you know, we're always looking for what's going to predict people's readmission, or what's going to predict that people mm -hmm. don't do well so that we can do something differently. And we're not actually collecting data on the thing that probably is one of the most important indicators of that. I think that, you know, people are sort of generally aware, maybe, at least people thinking of social determinants of health, 
that housing is important, but I'm not sure we're acting fully with that knowledge. In my mind, whether you're housed or not, whether you're in overcredited housing, whether you're spending a huge proportion of your income on housing, whether you're at risk of losing your housing, these should be things that the healthcare system should be assessing in everybody, both because it's going to help us take better care of the patient in front of us and help us explain what our patients are facing. But honestly, I feel like if we did, it would show us and it would give us more compelling evidence of why we need to be spending our resources on housing. Those are great tips for providers and those working within healthcare systems to really embed housing as a a data point for taking care of people. Is there anything else you can think of that the healthcare community can do to help remedy the problem of homelessness and awareness of how to better treat people who are living without shelter? I think there are a few things we can do. I think healthcare providers have a lot of trust, you know, that there is a lot of stock put in what healthcare providers say. And I certainly wish that healthcare providers as individuals use their bully pulpit to argue for the need for better housing policies. And then as an industry, I really, really wish that the healthcare industry would go forward and say, we can't do our jobs well if we don't fix these housing policies and would throw their weight, their political weight around the need to solve this crisis, this shortage of extremely low income housing, this shortage of rental subsidies, and all of the other things that need fixing. I guess I wish that um, healthcare providers would thinking about housing would say, this is my lane. You know, I think that Mm -hmm. has been a really effective message in things like gun violence. And I haven't seen the same outcry from healthcare providers to say, failed housing policies are our lane, both as individual providers, but also as health systems and the health industry in general. If the American Hospital Association, if the AMC, if all of these, you know, you know, AMA, if all the like big healthcare organizations went and put some of their lobbying power behind the fact that we don't fully fund vouchers, that we desperately need to fully fund housing vouchers, that we need to produce, um, preserve, protect affordable housing, it would go very far. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a great point of view. And we actually did interview Dr. Megan Ranney, who is part of this Is My Lane campaign. So Mm -hmm. I think there's a social media hashtag brewing here, if it hasn't already. exactly. (laughs) Housing housing is our lane. Yeah, housing is healthcare. It really is. Yeah. Um, So what's next for you in the homelessness and housing initiative that you're now leading up? Yeah, so we were very fortunate to get a very generous donation from the Benioff families, Mark and Lynn Benioff, to help us establish something called the Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. What it really is, is a group of us who are trying to use what we call strategic science to answer what are the looming questions in homelessness policy and programs, I like to say we're trying to do the change the three Ps. We're trying to change programs, policies, and perspectives. Um, we believe that a lot of what needs to be known about homelessness is already known. And our job is just to promote it, to translate it so that the general audience, so that policymakers can understand it. And then for us to help governments and nonprofits and other groups figure out what are the things that they don't know and get them quickly the answers that they need in order to create more effective policies. So we're working on a variety of things. We are about to embark on a big statewide in-depth survey of homelessness across the state of California to really better understand what were the policies that led to this, what were missed opportunities to prevent homelessness, what is standing in the way of people um, getting rehoused, how can the state better use their resources 
to house people. We've done a lot of work on COVID, on um, getting COVID vaccines to people who are homeless. Um, what is the messaging? What are the access barriers? And how do you overcome that? We're doing uh, projects on you know the role of shallow housing subsidies. So um, if people can't get full housing subsidies, would it work to give them you know a smaller amount of money? We're looking at um, folks who experience the most um, difficulty um, with homelessness, you know, homelessness combined with um, behavioral health conditions and how we can best serve that population. So we're just trying to sort of both translate the evidence base that already exists and create the evidence base where it doesn't exist and really make sure that the general public hears these messages, that policymakers hear these messages, that practitioners hear these messages. That's great. How can people like me support your work? You know, I think what we really want is people who become evangelists for housing. I think it's really not rocket science. What I like to say is everybody needs housing that they can afford. Some people need some services wrapped around it. Some people don't. It's as easy as that. There are a lot of myths out there. There are a lot of myths that people don't want to be housed or that people with severe behavioral problems can't be successfully housed. We have reams of evidence, some of the work that I've done and that other people have done, that show that those things aren't true, that even the people with the most severe behavioral problems, if you give them housing on what we call a housing first basis, which means that you start with the housing and then you offer them services to help support them, but you don't make those services mandatory, people will avail themselves of the services and they will remain housed. But people in the general public don't believe that. So what I really want is to get others to help us spread these messages. It is possible to end homelessness we, for the most part, know how to end homelessness. What we really lack are the resources and the political will to do so. Nobody wants to be homeless. Everybody can be housed. We just need to get the policies and the practices aligned. Well, that's a perfect way to end our conversation today. This was really an important and eye-opening 30 minutes and Thank you for the work that you do, and thank you for sharing your insights. And if everybody wants to follow you and your work, what's the best way that they can follow along? You know, they're welcome to follow me on Twitter at mkushel, at mkushel, or to follow us, um, uh, the BHHI on Twitter at, at UCSFBHHI, to check out our website at homelessness .ucsf.edu, um, and to really join us in becoming evangelists for housing. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cashel. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Heart of Healthcare podcast. If you liked today's show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare with Hallie Teco is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producers are Holly Teco and Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Brianna Seely and Andrew McDowell. It is mixed and edited by Brianna Seely. Our music is by Utah. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com. That's offscript, no T, dot com.